You have no idea how hard it is to train a bird to do that on command. <laughs> Just kidding, it was mayonnaise. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Jeremy Woltz. I am the young adult pastor as well as a small groups pastor here at Western Assembly of God. And uh, this morning, before we get started, we're, we're going to be continuing in our series that we've entitled Joyride as we work through our, our way through the letter to the Church of the Philippians. But before we get too far into this, I want to take a minute, and I actually want to recognize one of the unsung heroes around this place. His name is Mike Dalton. And the reason why I want to recognize him, and if you're curious about who he is or what he does, Mike Dalton pretty much has a hand to play in virtually anything that happens on our screens. The video that you just saw, our slides, any of the pictures or the graphics, if it's on a screen in this building, Mike Dalton had a, hand to pl had a part in it. Now, he deserves all the credit in the world for his work there. <laughs> you're welcome, Mike. But that's actually not why I want to draw attention to him today. Because I think Mike displayed an unbelievable amount of courage this past week. You see, Mike lent me his car to make that video. Now, the reason why I think that is of particular note, why that is specifically deserving of recognition this morning, is because let me show you what happened the last time I borrowed someone's car. Just take a look right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I made sure I showed Mike that after I gave him back his keys. So I've got a few, a few pictures we're just going to cycle through in the background, but please feel free to stare at that while I tell you the story. But when I was 16 years old, I decided to take my dad's car out for a little joyride. See, my, uh, my best friend at the time, his name was also coincidentally Mike, uh, he was coming over to hang out. But we're hanging out in the front yard, and he gets a phone call from the girl he's been crushing on now for months. And this is the call, right? This is the call where he is going to convince her he's boyfriend material. So I keep saying, Mike, come inside, come inside. And Mike says, no, man, your house is notorious for losing cell reception. If I cross that front door, I'm going to drop the call. So he won't come inside. He's hanging out in the front yard, and that's when I had a great idea. I said, hey, Mike, don't worry about it. I'll be right back. I'm going to get my dad's keys. We'll go for a little joyride. Now, an important detail in the story is that I was, in fact, 16 years old. However, I did not yet have my license. I was an unlicensed teenager who took it upon himself to take my dad's Oldsmobile Aurora with a V8 engine onto our neighborhood streets. Mike and I hop in, we pull out of the driveway, we start our way down these neighborhood roads, and it's a V8, right? Everybody in the room who understands what a V8 is, you know you don't have a choice, you have to put the pedal to the metal, right? You have to see what this baby can do, so we start going. And again, unlicensed, 16-year-old. In other words, I'm a very inexperienced driver. So we're flying down these streets. The next thing I know, we're actually going downhill. And as we're going downhill, we're picking up more and more and more speed. How much, I don't know, because I was too scared to take my eyes off the road. I was also too stupid to take my foot off of the accelerator. So we just keep going faster and faster and faster. And at the bottom of this hill, there is a hairpin turn. Now, if you have the vast experience driving that I do now, you know that it doesn't matter how hard you turn the wheel. If you're going fast enough, that car is going to go wherever the heck it wants. So at the bottom of this hill, I turn that wheel to the right as hard as I possibly can, all of my might, and the car's just not listening. And we just keep barreling it through the front yard of my neighbor's house. By the way, to make this worse, this was less than a half mile from my home. This is the shortest joyride in history. It's embarrassing to admit. I crashed my dad's car less than a half mile from our house. But here's what happened. We go barreling through the front yard of my neighbor's house, and this is the moment I knew I was in trouble. I looked through the passenger window, and I saw the back of my neighbor's mailbox. If you're in a car, and the car is in the right spot on the road, you should never see the back of someone's mailbox. You should only see the front, because that's how the mail gets in. And that was the moment when I saw the back of the mailbox, I thought to myself, oh no, we're in trouble. Of course, that thought didn't last very long, because in the very next moment, we went careening, pummeling, whatever, we crashed. We went straight into a clump of trees. Now, the first tree, as you can see, actually, not in this picture, but in one a little bit later, actually ripped off the bottom half of the passenger side door. We ping-ponged off of that first tree into another one that hit the driver's side door and punched it in so hard I actually felt it smack against my leg. And then the third tree. The third tree we hit straight on. And in that moment, it legitimately felt to me like that tree just cut the car completely in half. What it actually did was stop all momentum. Thankfully, I think the other trees slowed us down enough that, that we didn't die. But nonetheless, we went smacking into this final tree, and everything came to a crashing halt. And in the process, every bit of glass in that car shattered. And thankfully, it did. 
because the way that my door was punched in, I could not get it open, so I crawled my way out of the driver's side window, and I ran to the passenger side, and I said, Mike, Mike, are you okay? And Mike was conscious, and he was angry, understandably. I thought it was because I crashed the car. It turns out it's because he accidentally hung up the phone. <laughs> and I'm like, Mike, we need to get out of the car, man. We need to get to safety. And he says, no, no, I'm not leaving till I find my phone. And so he's sitting there and he's rummaging around and he's looking because he's going to call this girl back. I guess it was a really great moment in the conversation. I'm sorry to interrupt. But he's looking and looking and looking. And then the engine catches fire. Now, look, I know the more I tell the story, the more unrealistic it sounds. But believe it or not, this is all true. You can ask my parents. They're seated right here. And I'm sure they're already crying as they remember this story. It's all true. And the engine catches fire because it turns out if you, if you don't take the keys out of the ignition doesn't matter how you crash the car, it's gonna try and turn back on. You get enough sparks around enough flammable fluid, eventually you get flame. And that's what happens. The engine catches fire, and as the flames draw a little bit closer, bit by bit, Mike suddenly wanted to get out of the car. So I reach in to try and help him out. And that's when we discover one more problem. You see, the dashboard had crumpled in and had actually pinned his foot inside the car. So now Mike, with all of his might, is just sitting there trying to get his foot out. I reach in, I hook my arms under his armpits, and I'm yanking on him as hard as I can to pull him out of the passenger side window, and we're not budging. Now, after a few seconds that felt like an absolute eternity to the both of us, he managed to slip his foot out of his shoe, and we left that shoe behind for the greater good, and we pulled Mike out of the passenger window. We stumble across the street into our neighbor's yard and watch as my father's car goes up in flames. Now, to my father's credit, when he did come and see his precious V8 Oldsmobile Aurora going up in flames after he managed to rescue his golf clubs out of the trunk. <laughs> he turns around and he looks at Mike and me and his initial reaction is joy because we were still alive. Believe it or not, Mike came out, he had to get about six stitches for a laceration in his arm. I, on the other hand, was completely unharmed. It is an absolute miracle. I don't doubt that for a second, an absolute miracle. But after the initial shock and after the initial joy wore off, needless to say, I got grounded for pretty much the rest of my life. <laughs> in fact, I, I distinctly remember sitting across from the kitchen table as my dad described to me the duration as well as the severity of my punishment and as lengthy and as severe as that punishment was, I can tell you the punishment was actually not the worst part. You see, the worst part was just how stupid, just how worthless I felt after making such a big mistake. Nothing, nothing makes you feel not good enough like staring into your own flaming fireball of failure. So let me ask you a question this morning. Has there ever been a time in your life when you felt not good enough? Has there ever been a time in your life where you thought to yourself, I don't deserve what I have. I'm not worthy of my life. I am not good enough. Now, maybe it's because of something your parents said to you long ago that's just stuck with you. Maybe it's because of the friends you have are constantly tearing you down, even though they think it's funny. Maybe it's the bully in school that whatever they picked on you about, it's just stuck with you, and you drag it behind you like a weight you can't shake. Or maybe, maybe it's you. Every single time you make a mistake, every time you go back to that same sin, that same habit you can't break from, every single time you constantly repeat in that internal monologue, I'm just not good enough. I can't do it. I've got a suspicion that everyone here in this room, everyone watching us online, everyone has at some point in their life felt like they were simply not good enough. I'd be bold enough to say that most of you would even say that right now there's an area in your life, right now, where you don't feel good enough. And if that is you, if that relates to you in any way whatsoever, then let me tell you, I have some good news to share with you this morning. It's called the gospel. And the gospel tells us that even in the midst of our biggest failures, even amongst the many voices that are constantly shouting out that we are not good enough, there is one who speaks above it all, and his name is Jesus. And I'll tell you what the best part that we're going to discover this morning is that joy is found in what Jesus did, not in what we do. Pray with me this morning. And then we're going to dive into Philippians chapter 3. Father God, we come to you. We are so grateful to you to know that we can stand in your presence. 
to know that even though many of us are here and some of us are, are, are going really, really well in life right now, things are great, and we, we actually lean on ourselves to get through the day. But there are many more of us, Father, who understand that, that we can't do this alone and we lean on you time in and time out. And whatever the case, Father, you're there with us. And we give you praise because we know for whatever reason you, you have this almost backwards way of working where those of us who need you, who lean on you, who can't do it by ourselves, they're the ones that you draw closer to. And so, Father, we're grateful. We're grateful to you for being ever present in our lives. And so this morning, I just pray that any one of us who's here that needs to hear from you, needs to experience you, needs to draw close to you this morning would know that you are drawing close to us as we reach out. And you will take our hand. You will be in our presence. You will be our God from this day forward. And so, Father, we give you praise. Be with us. Help us to see, help us to learn what you have for us today. Father, in your name, we pray. Amen. So like I said before, we're continuing in a series entitled Joyride. We're talking all about this theme of joy. But the book of Philippians is what we're studying our way through. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3 today. And by the way, before I got up here, somebody said, man, I really pray that you slow down so I can keep up. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> it's been, I've been preaching for eight years, and I haven't slowed down yet. I'm sorry, but I promise I will do my best. Uh, if you need to, just like wave at me, and I'll see if I can slow down a little bit. But I, I, I honestly, I make no promises. Uh, but anyways... So Philippians chapter 3, we, we've been working our way through this letter to this church in Philippi. It was written by a guy named Paul. Now, Paul was essentially the all-star of the early Christian movement, right? He used to travel around all over the place. He would preach the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus, everywhere he went. But the most important thing that you need to know in regards to today is that Paul was a real-life historical person, a real person who wrote to real people about real issues, and so Paul picks up in Philippians chapter 3, and he starts off with these words. He says, Now finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And in fact, it is a safeguard for you. Now essentially what Paul says is, hey, I'm going to tell you something I've already told you, but you need to hear it again. Right? And it starts off really nice. Here Paul is, he's basically just saying, hey, find your joy in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, my brothers and sisters. But then all of a sudden, it's like he shifts gears. Right? He takes a really hard left turn, and the whole tone of what he's saying changes very drastically. Because in the very next verse, Paul goes on, and he says, so watch out for those dogs, for those men who do evil, for those mutilators of the flesh. How did we get here so quickly? How do we start with rejoice in the Lord, my brothers and sisters? It's so happy-go-lucky. It's so carefree. And then all of a sudden, we go to mutilation of the flesh. It seems a little sudden to me. But you see, the thing that you need to understand is that Paul was a really firm believer in saved by faith alone. Saved by faith alone. Now, essentially, saved by faith alone means you cannot earn your way into heaven. Right? Life is not a jail sentence. You do not get early release for good behavior. You cannot save yourself. Right? That's ultimately Paul's point. In fact, if you notice the language, well, essentially this, this, this teaching says that you can only be saved. You can only be saved by the one who saves. You cannot save yourself you must be saved by Jesus who saves. That is saved by faith alone. So essentially, the way that I want to put it to you today is that saved by faith alone means you cannot behave your way into heaven. You can only believe your way there. So everywhere Paul would go, everywhere he went, he would preach this saved by faith alone gospel, or the way I'm going to refer to it today, he would preach this belief-based gospel. And everywhere Paul went, he'd preach this, and then he'd move on. And right behind him, there were these, these certain people, these, these holier-than-thou types that kept popping up behind him. And you know the people I'm talking about. You know the holier-than-thou types. They're the ones who tell you you're going to hell because your knees are showing or because you once wore a hat inside. Or these are the people who say you're not as good as they are because you don't pray enough or you don't have enough of the Bible memorized or because you got a tattoo or a piercing or for any number of other behavior-based rules. See, Paul would travel around and preach a belief-based gospel. And then these holier-than-thou types would come right behind him and undo everything Paul tried to do. They would come and they would preach a behavior-based gospel. Now, I know we all have experience with this type of person. This is the type of person that, that seems to make it their business to make you feel like no matter what you do, you're never going to be good enough. 
And the truth is they've been around forever. They were around when Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians. They are around today, and I am sad to report they will likely be around until the very end of time. And Paul was clearly not a big fan. Paul did not like these people. In fact, we see as he calls them dogs, as he calls them people who do evil, as he calls them mutilators of the flesh. And it's that last one I want to focus on because, let's face it, that seems pretty specific, doesn't it? I get dogs. I get people who do evil. Those are just general insults. But mutilators of the flesh has to carry something pretty significant with it, doesn't it? Well, in verse 3, Paul continues. And almost as if he's talking directly to them. Paul says this. For it is we, you holier than thou is over there, and then us who are saved by faith over here. For it is we who are the circumcision. It is we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. You see, circumcision was a really big deal way back in the day. It was the way that the Jewish people would actually mark themselves as holy or as separate. Circumcision essentially was the seal of approval for God's people. So you couldn't be a part of God's people if you didn't have the right seal. If you've ever been to a concert in your life, if you've ever gone to a conference where they either put a stamp on the back of your hand or they gave you a specific lanyard you had to wear, that became your way of walking up and saying, hey, look, I belong here. That's circumcision. And without it, you did not belong to the people of God. And so these holier-than-thous, they kept going around preaching this behavior-based gospel. They kept going around telling everybody that unless you do this certain thing, unless you behave this certain way, then no matter how hard you try, you will simply never be good enough for God. And Paul is sick of it. Paul is so sick and tired of this false gospel, of this false truth, of this false teaching that keeps popping up behind him. And so he looks to them, and essentially, I'll paraphrase it for you, what he says is, hey, you want to know the difference between you holier than thou's and the rest of us? You want to know the difference? We glory in Jesus. We put no confidence in the flesh. But you, you glory in yourselves. You brag about how holy you are. You go around, you say, look at me. Look at how good I am. Look how much I give to charity. How many good deeds that I do. Look at how much of the Bible I had memorized. Look at how much of my day I spend praying. You brag about yourselves, but not us. We brag on Jesus because we know behavior can never make us good enough. Only Jesus does. Did you know even today, there are a whole lot of people who don't feel good enough to come to church. I'm not talking about health. I'm talking about value. I'm talking about worth. There are a lot of people who do not feel good enough to come to church. And the worst part is we did that. We did that to them every single time. We made them feel like they weren't good enough because they didn't wear the right clothes or they didn't talk the right way or they didn't do the right thing. We made them feel like they didn't belong here, in God's house. And that's what happens. That's what happens every single time that the belief-based gospel, the real gospel, the true gospel, takes a back seat to the behavior-based gospel so many of us choose to live by. And what we need to be reminded of, all of us, one and the same, need to be reminded of is the simple fact that you cannot, under any circumstance, behave your way into heaven. You can only believe your way there. Amen. And to prove his point, Paul goes on, and he does something I think is actually a little hilarious. He essentially begins to show off, right? He begins to brag on himself, Paul essentially starts to tell people all about the ways he is better than you and me in these holier-than-thous. And, and here's the deal. I actually think you can learn a lot about a person based on the way he or she writes. Right? They're writing their personality onto a page and handing it to you. Well, I think that you can learn a lot about Paul. And based on the way that Paul writes this letter to the Philippians, I get a sense Paul is that kind of guy that everybody really admires, everyone really respects at a distance. Nobody really likes him. Right, if you look at verse 4, I think you're going to see what I mean. In verse 4, just after he finishes saying, we put no confidence in the flesh, Paul then picks up and he says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, 
if anyone else thinks that he or she has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I got more. Right? Do you see what I mean? I think a lot of people respected him, but I really don't think people liked him. Because then what he does is he goes on and he begins to explain, like I said, all, all of his accomplishments, all of his achievements, all the reasons why if it did come down to behavior, he is already good enough. Now he's saying it so these holier than thou types will understand a pretty powerful point we'll get to in just a minute. But he picks up in verse five and he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day, right? I had that seal of approval from the earliest possible moment. He continues, I am of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now the first ever king of Israel was of the tribe of Benjamin. So what Paul is saying is not only am I full-blooded Israelite, I have royal blood in my veins. And then he says, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now think about it, when we see somebody who's truly a standout, we often say things like, oh, he is a man among men. She is a woman among women. It's our way of saying, even in a crowd, even among their peers, this is a person who stands out as superior above the rest. Well, here's Paul saying, I, I am a Hebrew among Hebrews. In regard to the law, I'm a Pharisee. I'm an expert. I'm a professional. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Paul right here claims that he is as close to perfect as it's possible for a person to get. He's everything a person was supposed to be. He's everything a person wanted to be. He did not need to be good enough because Paul was already great. And if, if it were possible to behave your way into heaven, then Paul was a shoe in In fact, I bet God would have met him at the gate himself, rolled out the red carpet and escorted Paul in. That's how perfect, that's how good, that's how great Paul was but, in verse 7, Paul continues, he says, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have willingly lost all things. I consider them rubbish. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Now that word rubbish, that word rubbish is in my opinion slightly mistranslated. See, it doesn't reply or doesn't refer to an old t-shirt that you wore then threw in a corner and you forgot about it. That isn't strong enough language. That isn't strong enough to explain to you what Paul is really getting at here. So the word that Paul uses here literally means, and excuse me for being crass, I didn't know the kids were gonna be in the room, but it literally means poo. It literally means excrement or dung, right? All those things, all those things that Paul has just finished bragging about, all that right behavior that made him good enough, it was as valuable as a steaming pile of poo. You get his point, right? Behavior, that's what it's worth. That's why the behavior-based gospel simply doesn't work because your accomplishments and because your achievements and because your behavior has as much ability to get you into heaven as does your dog relieving itself in the backyard. You cannot, you cannot behave your way into heaven. You can only believe your way there. And here is why. The rest of verse 9, Paul continues. He says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, not having a righteousness of my own making, but rather that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is only by faith. The danger of believing in a behavior-based gospel is believing that you don't need Jesus at all. If all you have to do is behave your way into heaven, then what do you need Jesus for? If all you have to do is behave well enough, then why was Jesus even nailed to that cross? The danger of believing in a behavior-based gospel is believing that you can do it yourself. You can fabricate or create your own righteousness. But the truth is it'll never work. Because no matter how hard you may try, your behavior will never be good enough to make you good enough. No matter how hard you try, the truth is that we all have a flaming car somewhere in our past. 
And if it did come down to behavior, we would already be disqualified. That's why a behavior-based gospel is really no gospel at all. As Paul has already made clear, and here's one of the things that I hope you really take home with you today. As Paul has already made clear, your greatest achievements, your biggest accomplishments, and for that matter, your greatest failures and your biggest mistakes can neither qualify nor disqualify you from heaven. Because behavior has as much to do with getting into heaven as does a soiled diaper. I want you to cling to the significance of that statement. There's nothing you've done and there's nothing you've failed to do that will ever keep you out of heaven, out of the love of Christ, out of the family of God. Because your behavior isn't what matters. Your faith does. This is a beautiful thing. But it sticks down to this one point. You cannot behave your way into heaven. But oh, thank God you can believe your way there. You see, our only hope, our only hope is Jesus Christ. Our only hope is Jesus, who by belief alone makes you good enough. The way it works, it doesn't make sense to us, but when you put your faith in Christ, he puts his goodness into you, and that's the very reason he went to the cross in the first place, so that you and me, all of us collectively, we could be forgiven of our sins. We could be forgiven of all the times, be it on purpose, be it on accident, that we did something that was bad, that was wrong, that was hurtful, or that was even just plain stupid. Jesus went to the cross to make you good enough. And the best part is that nothing can take that away. Nothing can ever take that away. So rejoice, my brothers and sisters, because joy is found in what Jesus did, not in what we do. So rejoice, my brothers and sisters, for you are good enough Rejoice, my brothers and sisters, because today, just as you are, you are enough for God. So rejoice, my brothers and sisters, because there is nothing, nothing you could ever do, nothing that could ever be done to you that could ever make you not good enough again. Joy is found in Jesus Christ. And joy is found in what Jesus has done once and for all. Thank God we don't have to behave our way into heaven. And thank Christ we can believe our way there. Now there's one last thing. One last thing I feel be irresponsible of me to say, or to, to, to not say to you today. Because I know that there are people who are going to hear this truth. They'll hear that, that it, it isn't your behavior that matters, it's your belief. And they're going to take that to mean that they can live whatever kind of a lifestyle they want. They're going to take it to mean that they can live reckless, selfish, perhaps even wicked lives. Because, hey, behavior doesn't matter. And while technically, okay, technically, I don't know about the merit of the argument, but technically, that could be true. But let me ask you this question. Don't you want to be worthy of the gift that you have already been given? When I was in the eighth grade, I wanted nothing more than to be on the school soccer team. And the truth is, I, I wasn't a particularly gifted athlete. I didn't have the, the ball control or the foot skills necessary. But nonetheless, I wanted nothing more than to be on the soccer team. So I went to those tryouts, and, and if I'm being honest, I did okay. I wasn't the worst kid out there, but I was a far cry from being the best kid out there. Only once did I fall on my face, but it did happen. But nonetheless, I went out and I tried out, and I wanted to be on this team because I really liked the coach. He was one of my teachers in school, and I knew that he also really liked me. And because he liked me, I'm convinced he gave me a gift that day. I'm convinced he gave me a spot on the team, even though I didn't deserve it. I know I wasn't as gifted, as talented as the other kids on the team. I know, I know I didn't deserve the spot that he gave me. But you know what? He gave it to me anyways. So you know what I did? I practiced more. And I trained harder for that team than I have ever trained for another soccer team in my life. 
because I was determined to be worthy of that team. Now, I never started a game. I barely saw the field. But I wanted to be good enough for the gift I'd been given. Not because I had to be. I was already on the team, right? I had already made it. I'd already achieved what I set out to achieve. I already had what I was trying to do. I didn't have to do it, but, but I wanted to. I wanted to be worthy of the gift I had been given. You see, that's the Christian life. We do not strive to be good people so that Jesus will love us. We strive to be good people precisely because Jesus loves us. See, in the end of all things, the Christian life is not a requirement for the love of God. It's a response to it. We've been given a truly incredible gift. Jesus has made us good enough. So even though we don't have to, let's do it anyways. Let's strive to be worthy of the gift that we have already been given. In closing, let me remind you of the three things that we really hit on today, and then we can head into prayer. First is simply this. You cannot behave your way into heaven. But through Christ, you can believe your way there. That is why joy is found in what Jesus did, not in what we could ever do. And thirdly, only let us live up to what we have already attained. Only let us strive to be worthy of the gift that we've already been given. Pray with me. Father God, we come to you this morning. We are blown away by the amount of love you have shown us time and time again, and we are over the moon grateful to you that we can stop trying so hard to be more than we are. We can stop trying so hard to make up for the mistakes of our past, that we can stop sitting here feeling like we're not enough because we once ran a car into a tree. Father, we're so grateful to know that through faith, you do all that for us. You make us enough. You make us good enough. You give us that confidence, that security, that comfort so that we can live in joy knowing that in the face of our biggest mistakes and in the face of our greatest achievements, our worth doesn't change. Our value is set on you and you, Father, will keep it the same. Nothing can tarnish or diminish how much you care for us. So, Father, we come before you and I ask that anyone who needs this in particular today would walk out of here feeling closer to you. Anybody who, who didn't previously know or at least didn't understand that they don't have to earn your love would walk out in freedom knowing that they've already got it. Father, I pray that today so many of us would experience you in a freedom and in a joy and in a confidence that we didn't previously know was possible. Father, we give you praise, and in the incredible name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. 